All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our fourth webinar in our advocacy series, Stakeholders of Advocacy. Let's jump right in. Next slide, please. A few short reminders beforehand, today's webinar will be recorded and will be available for viewing on PVA's website at pva.org. Closed captioning is available. Please click on the meeting controls bar at the bottom of your screen to turn it on. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Questions will be answered at the end of the program. Next slide, please. I'm Lisa Elijah, PVA's National Grassroots Advocacy Manager. I'm an Air Force vet and a PVA member. Hello, everybody. Um, you're probably already tired of hearing us say this, but hello, my name is Julie Howell, Associate Legislative Director here, and I'm also an Army veteran. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as a reminder, like we do every webinar, we're gonna cover the things that we've touched on so far in this series. Bear with me here, because we're gonna run through a lot of what we've already covered and then what we're gonna cover. So, so far in the series, we've discussed the fundamentals of government, the legislative process, Last month, we talked about understanding the issues and becoming a change agent. And today we'll discuss who's advocating and who with, or the stakeholders of advocacy. Don't forget to join us uh, for our last one next month, the art of advocacy and connecting the dots. That'll be on August 22nd. Next slide, please. So what we've covered. Uh, from last month's webinar, we got a little bit more in depth about advocacy. And so here are a few of the highlights um, we covered how to identify a policy area for improvement, developing solutions for those issues, crafting a message to get the word out, building a coalition to spread that message and knowing how to tailor that message for different audiences. Today, we're gonna to take a bit of a different format. Um, we've got two guests joining us today and their identity shall be revealed soon. Um, both of them are experienced in the world of advocacy, but they come from very different sides of the process and the discussion. We're super grateful that they were able to take time out of their busy schedules to join us today. Uh, next slide, please. So today, what we're gonna talk about are topics like how your experiences make you a better advocate and how sharing your experiences add legitimacy to your fight, how to personalize data in your app, and how to use your voice to highlight the data that you do find. We'll touch on advocacy at the national level with PVA, how to best leverage information provided to you, We'll briefly discuss the impact of your story and delivering that message. And lastly, we'll cover some etiquette and some expectations. Next slide, please. In previous sessions, we've mentioned the various levels of government and just to drive that point home one more time. Reminder, local, state, national governments, they're all mirrored off of each other. With different levels of government, that means simply more opportunities to advocate for your fight. At your local level, that could be your PTA, your church, your city council, or other local measures that you wanna get involved with. That could be advocating for a local piece of legislation, a matter of public policy that impacts your local zoning. It could even be a discussion within your chapter about fundraising or ways to spread information about your event calendar. An advocate is simply someone standing up and voicing a concern about an issue that impacts themselves and others. It doesn't always have to look and sound the same either. And I want to stress that point. Everything that exists between a local level and a national level, it's all free game and it's all still advocacy. Those church discussions, the PTA, maybe your local transportation folks in your community, nothing is too big or too small when it comes to advocacy. And remember, nothing gets accomplished alone. As we stressed in the last session, those coalitions that you build are critical in moving the needle on these discussions. Next slide, please. So what is a stakeholder exactly? Um, I know when I first popped on the scene, I kept hearing stakeholders and I was scratching my head a lot about what that actually meant. Well, fun fact, shout out to Steve. Um, anyone and everyone can be a stakeholder. They're simply people interested or concerned with an issue. That means that when you're advocating, each of you is a stakeholder. The members of your coalition, they are all stakeholders, as are the elected officials and their staff that you talk to. Also, your chapter is a stakeholder, your fellow members. This becomes especially true if your chapter is united around an issue to re or around a cause that's resolving something at the local, like, local level, which Lisa and one of our guests will be discussing later. Um, when it comes to the data 
You could even argue that researchers that have published that data are stakeholders. Um, that information usually highlights gaps in policy areas. And in theory, they did that research to address discrepancies. So again, everybody that touches this information and everybody that's part of your fight is technically a stakeholder. Next slide, please. One more. There we go. So legitimacy through life experiences. Something I always stress with people when we talk about advocacy is that nobody has ever lived your life. Sure, we're veterans. We all have similarities in our experience, but no one has ever been in your shoes and experienced the world in the way you have. Because of that fact, your experience matters. You are a true subject matter expert in your own life and how you've navigated spaces. Congress and their staff, if you're advocating on a national level, like something at our advocacy seminar, they need to hear about your experiences. Those barriers that you may have faced, the challenges that you've encountered, they need to know about them. How you navigate spaces, particularly if you have a mobility limitation or a wheelchair user, those experiences are critical in identifying barriers. As just a quick example, for many of you have probably joined us in Capitol Hill um, and gone into these offices. And sometimes maybe furniture needs to be pushed around because there's not enough space in smaller offices for multiple wheelchair users and all the busy hustle and bustle that's going on. So many of you have probably either seen furniture be moved around or maybe even had to take a meeting outside the hall. Um, that's an example of how experiences can be felt by the people around you. Staff likely never really thought about the way their office was laid out and what that would mean for a wheelchair user. Um, I'm pretty sure those memories stick with them. And I know that when we go back to follow-up meetings, we hear it a lot from staff when they're like, you know, it never even crossed our mind to think about that. And so again, those experiences, those barriers you identify, when you tell your story and you voice your concern, your experience is what drives the needle on some of these things. Next slide, please. So person, one, one back. There you go. Personalizing the data. Many of you have probably heard me say repeatedly that our members are the human face of data. Staff and other people can read study after study about accessibility, but after having a conversation with you about the barriers that you've encountered, that has a different kind of impact. Data is just numbers on a page, but when we can humanize those numbers and you are able to provide context for those numbers and share your experience, that personalizes that information. When it comes to the issue you're trying to fix, like we said last time, search for data that bolsters your point and your cause. Now, I wanna be very clear. I'm not saying you should take random information off the internet and manipulate it to your benefit. Do the exact opposite of that. Uh, there's a lot of search engines out there. There's a lot of information on the internet. There's a high probability that there's a study out there that's gonna help you drive your ass. Um, maybe you're looking to solve an issue on accessible transportation in rural communities. Put that into a search bar and a ton of information is going to pop up. Sort through that and see what the numbers say. Use that data to help craft your message. When you use real statistics within your message, it adds additional legitimacy to that ask. It shows that you're serious about what you've prepared and it shows that you're ready for this discussion. When you mention that you face barriers as a rural veteran who needs accessible transportation, if you can top in some numbers to show that there's a demand and that there's a need, that really packs a punch. Uh, next slide, please. So advocacy within PVA. I just want to briefly discuss uh, advocacy at the national level. Most of you already know that we hold our annual legislative sem seminar in DC every year. That's an opportunity for you to come to DC and help advocate for our legislative priorities. We let you loose on Capitol Hill and help you to, and expect you to amplify the voices of all PVA members. Sometimes there's also an opportunity to join us for Hill visits um, around certain legislation, thanks to Zoom. Sorry, I got a little distracted there. Um, I also wanna just mention briefly that there's always an opportunity for you to advocate when you're not even here. You can sign up for Action Force, our voter voice platform. You can go to that webpage, sign up for action alerts. And when we do a big campaign on a piece of legislation, you can click yes, and it generates a letter to your elected officials. That is a very impactful tool that you are able to use and advocate from the corner of your own home. Uh, the last thing I do want to stress is something, again, that we discussed last time, those coalitions. 
bigger coalitions are needed to move the needle on some of this stuff. So more voices in more places increase the chances of gaining co-sponsors for some of these bills. That's how we get them moving. If Action Force is all you have the bandwidth for, that's totally cool. Every single one of your voices matter and every single one of you deserve a seat at the table, but sometimes that's all you have the capacity for. Keep doing it, keep clicking the button, keep, keep sending those letters. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, you're probably tired of listening to me at this point, so I would like to introduce one of our guest speakers. Uh, this John Towers has joined us. John is a former staffer who worked on both the House and Senate Veteran Affairs Committee, and he's currently the policy director for Brownstein Hyatt, Barber, and Shrek. And hopefully I didn't say any of those wrong. Um, let's see, there we go. Hey, John, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Hi, how you doing, Julie? I'm well, thank you. Um, so we'll just softball some questions over to you. Um, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to the webinar. Um, I have been here at Brownstein for almost four months, um, and that has uh, come on the heels of a 26-year career up on Capitol Hill, all of which were spent with both the Senate and the House Veterans Affairs Committees uh, on the Republican staff. So I did 16 years on the Senate uh, VA Committee and 10 on the House Committee, with the last 10 uh, being as a staff director, eight in the House and a little over two in the Senate. So I've I've seen a lot over the last 26 years, and I've enjoyed being in the minority and the majority as a staff director in the House and the minority in the Senate. And for a glorious three days, I was staff director in the majority in the Senate uh, from January 3rd until a dismal uh, showing in Georgia on January 5th, 2001. But um, anyway, so, but um, glad to be here at Brownstein now and, and work in the same uh, space, advocating for companies who want to do business with VA and help veterans um, and advocating for things that are really good for veterans just from the other side of the table. That's awesome. And thank you again for all of your long work on both sides of, uh, wait, in the bicameral, everyone will remember that word, bicameral. Uh, Space, when it comes to veterans, you've already answered my second question of how long did you work in the veteran space? So how about we go with, um, if you wouldn't mind, take a few minutes to describe maybe how different your experiences were at various stages of leadership. I know you sort of ran the gamut ground up, you know, um, maybe you can say how advocacy has impacted you at various stages of your time on the Hill. Sure, uh, I mean, I've had the benefit of, like you said, uh, being with the committees from the ground up, from a lowly legislative correspondent to legislative assistant, professional staff member, senior policy advisor, deputy staff director, staff director. And how that has helped me um, has been to understand really what my employees uh, have, have are experiencing, what they expect of leadership at my level. And I, I don't have... Uh, far to draw on my own experiences at every level of the organizations to know what things turned me on or turned me off from leadership styles. Uh, but that extends also to my work with the various advocates that have come in uh, over the years. Uh, I've gotten a good handle on what's effective and what's not. Uh, I won't say that I've, I've perfected what's effective and whatnot. And I'm actually, I am an advocate now. My part of my job is to go up to the Hill and and advocate for with a lot of my former colleagues. And I, I am learning and trying to draw on what uh, worked in, in, in my case as a staffer on the Hill and trying to apply what's best there and leave out the things that I didn't like. I mean, you definitely have the experience to be able to parse through some of that stuff. Um, is there any chance you could share with our members maybe a few things that stood out to you that you are carrying on with? like? I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, what, some of the issues? Or some of, just more some of the tactics that have worked. Like what maybe has stood out to you about really effective advocacy? Sure. Uh, well, the first thing that stands out is knowing what you're talking about. Um, it, it does not take very long in the course of a meeting 
for a staffer to know that the person who is giving the presentation does not have a, a grasp of the facts um, and you know just has not prepared very well. And so that, that would be probably the, the first and foremost thing is to know the issue that you're advocating inside and out so that one, you present with a clarity um, and, and two, you're able to answer any question that comes your way. Uh, I would also say be very clear on what the ask is of congressional staff. I have been through so many meetings over my career where it is just kind of a kind of a lazy presentation and the staff is left wondering, well, what is what do you want me to do with it? What, what are you asking of me? And inevitably, as the years went on, I would ask that question at the very end. What are you asking? And some of the worst meetings are when the person at the other side of the table says, well, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not even sure what we're asking. Uh, so clarity up front of what the ask is. And if it's, there is no ask, if it's just an informational meeting, I, I, I really want you to be aware of, uh, you know, whatever the issue is. I want you to be alert to it not asking anything now, but we may come back in several months uh, for an ask. But right now, I just want you to be aware of what we do. So I, I think those are the things that, um, uh, that I would encourage anybody who's advocating to keep in mind. Know your stuff and be clear what the ask is. Also, don't be afraid to have a sense of humor. You know, staffers, they're approachable. They're nice. Um, they're, they're people just like the rest of us. Um, you know, mix in some funny anecdotes or don't be afraid to have a sense of humor. Um, I, I always enjoyed those meetings more and, and they were more memorable to me uh, when the personality of the person uh, involved came through. Great, thanks for all that. Um, actually, to that point, uh, the things that stood out for you, um, any chance you have like a fun memory of a meeting, like a specific one that went really, really well or really, really bad? Well, it's funny. I was listening uh, to you go through your slide presentation and you emphasized telling uh, your personal story because your stories are the best advocacy that there, that there is. Um, and so the best meetings that I've had the most effective are when individuals came in and told uh, either and it was obvious sometimes what their story would be. These might be veterans who are missing limbs. These might be caregivers who brought their, uh, their spouse with them who was in need of caregiving assistance. And some of, some of the meetings that I remember most, um, you know, back in 2005, 2006, there were three severely disabled vets who came in. They were recently uh, uh, convalesced from the war in Iraq, they had missing limbs and they came forward with an idea uh, that they wanted to put on the books, on in law, a program to provide traumatic injury insurance to severely wounded. And they didn't want anybody to pay for this with, uh, for them, no taxpayer support at all. They wanted this purely an insurance program. And their example in arguing that and base it they based it on their individual circumstances from after they were injured to their convalescence in the hospital to the expenses associated with their family members who would come to the hospitals and, and often give up jobs and uh, incur significant expenses while their loved one was convalescing. They used all of those personal details and personal examples to really drive home the point that there was a gap in the service that the government was providing that needed to be addressed. And I, at that point, was working for a senator who was so impressed with the presentation that that advocacy led to a change in law and the creation of the Traumatic Injury Insurance Program in a little over 30 days. Um, the, the, the bill language was crafted. It was offered as an amendment on an appropriations bill, moving appropriations bill when it was enacted into law. And I could say the same thing about the caregiver program. We had a constituent of the member that I worked for at the time who was caring for um, her veteran husband who had a traumatic brain injury, needed lots of attention at home. And she detailed how she had to give up her job 
uh, and all of the various things that she had to wrestle with as a spouse of a, uh, a significantly injured individual. And, um, you know, that just spoke volumes and highlighted the need for a greater assistance that the government needed to provide it to family caregivers. And that, that advocacy led to the creation of the caregiver program. So those were, you know, two examples that really stood out. And those were earlier in my career, but there are many. But advocating based on your personal experiences um, and often, and Julie, you hit on this, you know, coming to a meeting in a wheelchair and having to move furniture around can be an eye opener for staff about mobility issues or things that maybe don't cross our minds on a day-to-day -day basis that your that PVA's membership deals with on a on a minute by minute basis can be so powerful. Um, right before I left the Hill, there was a hearing at which um, one of the witnesses was testifying. He was from the Blinded Veterans Association. So he's a blind gentleman and he's testifying about the need to, uh, for, for Congress to change, change legislation or VA to be more sympathetic to the needs of vision impaired uh, individuals. And he made the point as the red light came on at the witness table, which really signals to witnesses that you're supposed to be done speaking because you get five minutes. And he says, I don't even know if the light has come on. There is no vision impaired assistance here in the Congress in this hearing room, which to me was a, you know, here we, I've been doing this for 26 years and we have had uh, blinded veterans testify before. And at no point were we sensitive to the fact that our technology that we have at these tables is a bit outdated and probably needs to be updated. So just a small example of how you are the best advocates for your cause, your organizations or whatever issue that you're hoping that the Congress, either through oversight of VA or through a change in law, um, can accomplish. That's great. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. A um, couple of the questions we'd had prepared were sort of organically covered. So how about if you had one piece of advice to give the members that are on the call or any other advocate, like any little nuggets that you want to pass on to everybody? Uh, you know, we did cover that a little bit. Like I said, be clear up front about what you're there for and what you're asking uh, of the staff that you brief. Um, do not use political talking points given to you by one side or the other. We will know. And in this space, it is just not necessary. Um, it is I call it the, the best mission in government because it is being an advocate for those who've served our country. And so, and so I think staff get very sensitive to when there is a suggestion of a political uh, pitch or a political angle to a brief. And so to the extent you're using information that you got um, online or otherwise that that is slanted one way or the other, I would highly recommend not going with that because um, it'll be, it, it'll be, um, it'll be realized. Absolutely. That's one of the things that we're hoping to stress to our members, you know, the veteran space, apolitical. Um, we got, we got stuff to do. No one needs to worry about the politics of any of Absolutely. Um, John, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know that you're a busy guy. You can feel free to. <laughs> Come or go, but uh, now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Lisa to take away the rest of this. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, John, for joining us. All right. A few things to remember when you're preparing for advocacy. When you're provided handouts for meetings, make sure you give them out. Sometimes we can be so busy with speaking about our issues, materials can be easily forgotten. Talking points are highlighted to keep us on track and to keep the message simple. The easier we can make our ask, the easier it will be to weave into your story. Do research with an office's priorities beforehand, the people you'll be speaking with, the places the offices may have visited. One tool is congress.gov, where you can see what bills they've introduced, and it links to their webpage where their main priorities are located. It's an easy way to open dialogue and to help foster a relationship you will use in the future. Think about what policies do they tend to hold up as important. 
What are committees are they on? What values do they align with? And in what way can you relate those things to your advocacy goals? Make sure you stay on topic. You have a finite amount of time, sometimes maybe 10 to 15 minutes to get your point across. And every second is important in what you're advocating for. Next slide, please. When you're giving materials to look over for your advocacy efforts, please look over them. They're there to help you. Meetings can be stressful. And if you need a reminder on topics or data, the material will give you talking points and guide you. Weave information from the material with your own lived experience. The talking points and data are great, but your story is what ties everything together. Connect the dots for them and make it a memorable experience through the use of you. Be very mindful of time. When you go in to present your message, make sure it's persuasive. Sometimes you only have a small window of opportunity. You may only get one meeting with a politician to discuss your issues. You may only have five minutes with a department head. Preparing for your meeting is essential when you have a short amount of time to make your impact. Keep your introduction concise. Make sure you are direct about your issue in a meaningful way and let them know how they can help. If you knew you had one chance to reach the decision maker, take a moment to think about what you would want to say and how you would want to say it. If you ask for information, if they ask for information and you don't have it, be honest about that. Don't try to make something up and instead tell them you'll send that information to them later on. It also creates and keeps a way for the dialogue to be open. Remember, above all else, authenticity. That is why you are being asked to be there because of who you uniquely are as a person. Next slide, please. Always be polite. You are presenting not only yourself, but the priorities you're advocating for. How you represent yourself leaves a lasting memory for topics you are covering. Don't swear and try to avoid being very direct in how you think of certain politics. You are there to advocate on an issue and with a meaningful discussion and overt politics can be very divisive. You are building a relationship and part of that is being willing to listen to the other person. Use active listening to see if they have any asks and how you can be a part of that conversation. Don't talk over others. Remember, it's a conversation. Think relationship building. Dress for success. Dress to set a stage on the importance of how you view the issues. Next slide, please. Keep in mind when you're talking to influence the congressional office, do not discount the staffers. They play a huge part and their advice is listened to by legislators. It may be off-putting at times if you go into a meeting and you see a young staffer, possibly in their early 20s. Most of the staffers I've worked with have been pursuing their goals since high school or for a very long time. They're working as pages in high school and then interns in college and finally waking up their way up to the position they have now. They absolutely know what they're doing and they're the subject matter experts on their policy. Next slide, please. All right, I'm very excited to introduce our next guest, Scott Griffith, a US retired army and current government relations director and treasurer Wisconsin's chapter and vice chair of the ACGRD. Uh, Scott, if you take a moment, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Scott Griffith. I work with the Wisconsin chapter. Um, I've been in the advocacy realm for about eight years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, kind of low key and uh, recovering from a, um, an injury myself. Um, I am a PVA member. Um, I have a spinal cord tumor um, inside my cervical cord. I've had cancer for 24 years now, and I make that a point to say that I have cancer, cancer doesn't have me. I've been in this battle a long time and I will stay in the battle as long as I can. Um, I did retire from the Army uh, 25 years, both active and reserve, and I served as a Department of Defense civilian employee during that time as well. Um, served all over, I'm an eighth generation combat veteran. My father retired from the Air Force. So I grew up military and military issues and taking care of veterans is, is what I know and what I love. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, I know you're an advocate um, and I wanted to kind of get an idea of how did you first get involved in advocacy? Absolutely, Lisa. I was, uh, again, you know, when, when I was recovering from my injury, I didn't want a whole lot to do with, with anybody but myself. Um, but I ran into an individual um, who was manning a respite center and started talking to me a little bit about the chapter. 
and more about advocating and becoming an advocate and, and using my voice to help the other members. And then I met a gentleman by the name of Gus Sorensen, who was our government relations director. Uh, for those of you who don't know Gus or remember Gus, Gus is kind of the Yoda of government relations directors um, in the chapters and has been advocating for us and for veteran benefits for a very long time. Um, I, I mentored under Gus uh, for two years before I took the, uh, the helm from Gus um, and became the government relations director at the chapter. And then just through normal attrition, um, day-to-day -day manning of the chapter and people moving on to different positions, my capacity at the chapter grew um, into kind of a uh, operations officer type position um, just because there was, I was the last one to turn the lights off. So someone had to do it, <laughs> but uh, it's been educational. It's, it's been fun. Um, I've been part of the ACGRD, um, not in a leadership role, but in a leadership role for the last two years. And I can tell you, and I would urge you that if your chapter is not a member of the ACGRD, um, that you should join. The cost is, is, is really nominal. Uh, the current dues is $200 a year. Um, and the value that you get for that dues is, um, is this bar none. You can participate in our monthly ACGRD calls where we get updates from the national staff, from Lisa, Julie, Heather, uh, the whole team on the legislative priorities and kind of where those legislative actions are at over and above what, you're, what you will see in the Voters Voice um, Action Center. You'll get more up-to-date information, um, more pertaining to, to what's currently going to be passed, if, we think it's, if they think it's going to be passed, um, where they need your support and things like that, that you can take back to your chapter just to help get more voices uh, to join those campaigns. Um, additionally, there are grants and scholarships that your chapter could apply for to send more members to the National Advocacy and Legislation Seminar. Traditionally, it was in the fall. Next year, it will be in the summer. But the ACGRD normally issues five to six grants to chapters uh, to help cover cost to, to get members to uh, the seminar. So again, a great benefit. Um, plus you'll have access to resources like this video that's being recorded on the PVA website, um, plus other legacy information and job aids that were put together by previous government relation directors as to how to be a government relations director, how to advocate um, at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level as well. So again, great, great benefits. Um, you know, PBA National uses the Voters Voice program in Wisconsin. We also use that program to help advocate for legislative actions at the state level. Um, and we've, we've been able to kind of spread our wings and embrace the entire veteran community on a very nonpartisan uh, level and get other VSOs to help support our initiatives. One of the one of the great success stories was we we had members, chapter members who were continuing their education at UW campuses throughout Wisconsin, and they were incurring fees to park in disabled parking, even though they had a disabled placard or a disabled plate. Um, the UW systems were charging additional fee to utilize those parking spaces. So we were able to successfully advocate and get a state representative to introduce language that would abolish those fees on UW campuses. We got our members to send letters using voters voice to their districts, to their officials. Uh, we got other VSOs to help champion the cause and it was successfully passed. Um, so that voters voice platform is a powerful tool. It can be used at the chapter level the cost for that is pretty nominal. I don't want to quote prices, but it's around $5,000 a year um, to support 25,000 users in your state. So um, small pendants to pay to, um, to use that powerful tool. And there's also polling tools, uh, distribution list um, that you can use within Voters Voice and it works well with other contacts. 
uh, software that you may or may not be using, like Constant Contact, um, MailMonkey, and things like that. Um, it also allows you to gain some information, which I like. Um, I don't want to repeat what Julie has said, what Lisa has, Lisa has said, what Heather has said in the past, or what John has said. But when you go into a congressional office or um, either on the House side or the, or the Senate side, you know, being the subject matter expert, knowing what you're talking about is important and how to drive that home. And one of the most or one of the best tools that I've used to drive it home is I can talk numbers of constituents in their district. Who, if I'm not from their district, who am I there representing? And I've got that number right on, right on the top of my hand and I'll let them know. And then I, I not only use the veteran population, but the veterans family population and the caregivers too. So that number can exponentially be a lot larger with the voices that you are representing while you're there in that office. Uh, that's been a great tool for me, um, along with building the relationships um, with the people. Um, I was talking with Lisa earlier, and she was asking me some of the, uh, the ways that I get to know the staffers. And I try to get to know them before I even meet them the first time. And I use resources at my disposal, like LinkedIn, um, just to connect with the person, learn um, if they're a staffer, you know, Senator Baldwin's office, most of her staffers come right out of Madison. Um, they all graduated from UW-Wisconsin-Madison, so I try to find out that information, and then I'm sure to wear a, a nice UW-Madison Badger tie when I go into that office, um, just to, uh, to help uh, break the ice, if you will. Um, so knowing your audience, um, in addition to knowing your facts, um, PVA National does an exceptional job of putting the facts together for you and helping you rehearse your elevator pitch, but then use those handouts that they give you. I've used them. I've dog-eared pages. I'll open up the booklet when I'm in the office to talk about specific issues. If that issue doesn't personally affect you, be sure to try to have a story from a constituent from that representative's district that ties to that priority, whether it's modifying housing, additional auto loans, expanding caregiver support, um, all of those issues um, we've been talking about for the last several years, and we're still chipping away at getting those legislation, legislative actions um, through Congress. Um, another good tool to have is to make sure um, to check with your membership if any of them would be willing to share their contact information with the representatives, um, the congressmen, congresswomen, senators, um, when they come back home, when they're on break, we were just talking earlier about the August recess coming up. When they're back home, sometimes they like to get out in the public and uh, not just kiss babies, but uh, visit, uh, visit veterans. And if there's someone who has a unique need um, that's not being met, um, you know, maybe they can go see in person and see what a day in the life looks like of a veteran living in a home that has not been modified or that's been partially modified or a veteran that's still staying in acute care because their home hasn't been modified and they can't be discharged until they can be safe at home, whether that's a home modification or caregiver support or having a trained caregiver. Um, so again, you know, you want to make sure you check with your membership, uh, find out who has that unique story, and then make sure you have their permission to, to share their information with those representatives. Um, you know, know your representatives. We're fortunate in Wisconsin that we have three veteran representatives. We have Congressman Van Orden, Congressman Gallagher, Congressman Fitzgerald, and I actually served with, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald, um, in the same Army Reserve outfit for several years. So it's nice to have that personal connection, um, but you know, get to know the elected officials. Um, a lot of times, if they're veteran, their preference is to have a veteran staffer on board as well. And it's very easy to communicate um, using veteran acronyms or vernacular uh, to get to drive the point home. Um, you know, without sharing war stories, just to stay on point, but to be brief as possible. 
uh, to communicate the message for the time that you do have with them. Um, I've been doing this now for about eight years. Um, I can tell you, just as an example, one of the, I wasn't responsible for the success of this legislation getting passed, but earlier on we were advocating for continued IVF funding. And I was able to tell a staffer that within their district, they had a young man who was injured at the age of 19. He was an army um, tanker and he was in a unit that was training for deployment. And he was at Fort Carson, Colorado. And his sergeant was in the tank and, and outside the hatch. And the tank started to roll over and this young veteran unbuckled himself and reached up and pulled his sergeant out of that hatch, saving his life, um, but creating his catastrophic injury and becoming spinal cord injury. And at the age of 19, he could no longer procreate. Uh, so he could not have a family. And it was due to the continued IVF funding um, through the VA that he and his wife were able to procreate successfully and have a healthy, bouncy baby boy. And the staffer that I was talking to uh, was a female staffer, and she happened to be pregnant. Um, and I, I can tell you the story brought her to tears, not to be that I was being mean to make her cry, but I can tell you the importance of that story took the torch out of my hand and put it in her hand, and she became the champion for that cause. And that's the kind of connection um, that I encourage you to make with your storytelling to personalize it to that level where when you leave there, you know that they're excited about what you came to talk to them and they're gonna champion your cause. So beautiful story. Very Thank important. You um, so I guess you had mentioned kind of building that relationship, learning and connecting with them ahead of time. Like what are ways that you continue to have that relationship and have that dialogue even after the meeting is done? Great question, Lisa. So, you know, your your interaction with that staffer doesn't stop, start or stop, you know, with that meeting on the Hill. Um, sometimes if they're lucky, they get to come back to district, they get to travel with the representative when they come back home. Um, another tool to have in your toolbox is a list of activities that the chapter has and when, when and where they're at and be sure to invite them, you know, especially if it's during recess, if they're gonna be back home. Um, invite them to those activities, to come out and meet the members, to actually see the people that have those stories, if it's not your story, um, to see, you know, uh, we do boot camps for the National Veteran Wheelchair Games, and to see these veterans train to compete in National Veteran Wheelchair Games is phenomenal. If there's, if you have a, a veteran that has um, uh, a high level service award from their military service, whether it be peacetime service or combat service, you know, make sure they know about that veteran. Um, we were fortunate that we had Paralympians um, in our membership. So we were, we were sure to tell the representative and their staffers to follow these Paralympians as they go and compete in Rio. And, you know, that gave them kind of bragging rights. Hey, look at us. You know, this is one of our constituents from back home and they're competing athletic athletically on a national level. Um, our wheelchair, the USA men's basketball team for those five athletes that brought home the gold were all from UW uh, Wisconsin uh, Whitewater. Um, and they had trained there. And the coach was a, a female basketball coach from Whitewater who was previously on a Paralympic U.S. team. Um, so those are things that stick out. Those are things that, um, you know, that they'll remember. Thank you so much. I mean, those are so incredibly helpful. Um, we're going to pause it there for a moment. I'm going to hit on a few more things and then we'll bring you right back so you can be a part of our Q&A as well. Great. Thank you. All right. Next slide, please. So in closing, make sure you come prepared to advocate. Practice ahead of time and what you have your timing right and that you're staying on track with your subject. Be kind to both yourself and others. Advocating can be a very vulnerable process where you're sharing deeply personal things. 
take time to be proud of yourself and the ways you're putting yourself out there. It takes a lot of courage to share those parts of you. After you meet with offices, take time to reflect on it. What went right? What are ways that you can adjust for the next go around? What are some things you really meant to touch on that you weren't able to, that you'd like to focus on next time? Um, you are building relationships and remember that takes time. Ask if you can meet again, if new information about your issue comes up. And remember, you are the human portion of data. Offer to be a resource if they need more information or help in discovering ways to create change. Policy is complicated, but adding a story like yours allows to condense the idea into something tangible. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to have Heather Ainsley, whom is not new to us, but is newly minted title of Chief Policy Officer, along with Scott and Julie, join us in our Q&A portion. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. So thank you, uh, Lisa and Julie and Scott. Uh, for your uh, time here today and for your willingness to uh, help us understand more about issues related to um, the, the being a good advocate and what that looks like. Uh, we do have a few questions um, that have been put in our Q&A box, and we will remind folks to, uh, to put any questions that you might have there. Uh, one question that we have, and, and Scott, I'm wondering if you might be able to help us think through this, is uh, one of our uh, chapter members um, asked about transportation, and access to transportation is a big issue in his area. And he's asking, you know, how can I get more options in my area? What do you recommend as a as a, a PBA chapter when you're trying to get uh, you know more options, particularly for wheelchair users, you know, in a local area, in a state area? What can you do, kind of working on the ground, to try to increase those options? A great question. I know um, here in in Wisconsin, we kind of backstop the VA transit system um, where that the current contract, they changed contractors and we had a lot of veterans upset because they were used going, they were accustomed to going to their VA appointment with Bob. Bob knew them, Bob knew where to pick them up, Bob knew what time to pick them up and they were very upset when they could no longer see Bob. So we kind of helped uh, with the transition of that Transstar service and the different contracting services. But when they stopped traveling outside of the 50 mile radius of Milwaukee, we started finding other contract vendors to help get our veterans um, to their appointments. Additionally, um, in Wisconsin, we have an entertainment policy for any of our members to use, and they can use that entertainment policy for us to reimburse or pay for transportation. So we have a company out of Chicago land, it's called Toodle Transportation, and it very much is a wheelchair Uber and they will come to the house and pick up the veteran and, and their caregiver and take them to their appointments. And our chapter actually pays for that and covers those costs. So I would encourage every chapter to, to look at that and um, you know find those resources because they are out there. Um, the, the county bus system here in Milwaukee has an excellent program for seniors. So any of our veterans who are over the age of 62 who are in a wheelchair can use that County Plus system for only $4 a ride. So there are systems out there that, um, that you know, are, are, are already exist. So keep, uh, keep asking those questions. Well, thanks, Scott. I think that is a I'm reminded of uh, a lot of funding recently that is coming through the Department of Transportation to state and local governments. Um, and a lot of that is locals um, hearing from their constituents that this is important to them. So working with other groups in your local area um, to make sure that your elected officials know, hey, we want you to apply for those grants. We want you to make those connections to help us. Um, are really important things that you can do. And, and we're always happy to help folks strategize um, if you wanna reach out um, to us here at Nationally directly. Um, one of the things, and this came up a lot during the conversations uh, uh, that we had today was sometimes the subject matter of, the, of an issue is, is quite personal. You know, it may impact you directly, um, what it is you're talking about. And, and sometimes, um, you know, you have the opportunity to be really vulnerable in sharing what a particular policy means to you. What is the experience that you've had? 
Um, why do you need somebody to change it? But that can that can also come as a cost um, for the person who's having to relive that experience or to share it. Um, so this is for any of you, what do you suggest that a person can do who's advocating for something to help them stay focused um, on, on the advocacy point um, without uh, getting into a part of maybe having to have rethink about their own experience that might be uh, too difficult for them? I know. Great, great question. We all we all have triggers, right? And uh, we own them. They're, they're ours. Um, you know, there was a time when um, I've had multiple surgeries and I've been paralyzed from the neck down um, and in a wheelchair two times and rehab myself out of the wheelchair. Um, but there were there was a time when I could not be discharged from a hospital until I could prove that I had adequate care and modifications at home. And that was very frustrating for me. So I could use that as my personal example. Um, and I could speak uh, with a little bit of sharpness to my tone about the frustration that I felt, but yet keep that in perspective so I don't, you know, kind of. Uh, re-traumatize myself being mad at the world and mad at the, the healthcare system as it is. Julie, do you it's all right. I'm going to, yeah, I'll piggyback off of Scott. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I know that when I first started this work back in 2018, um, advocacy was really triggering for me. I didn't really play around in veteran spaces very much outside of my university campus. And so slogging through some of the issues and the concerns around, you know, combat exposure and everything else, it was triggering for me and it took some time and distance for me to really understand how to grapple with topics that are near and dear and direct me or impact me directly. I think the key to all of this and allowing yourself the space to share these really vulnerable moments is reminding yourself that you can't fill from an empty cup. And that's so cliche, but it's also so true. So if you're having, you know, two days on the hill because you're here for seminar and you notice that it's getting to you, it's okay to pull back a little bit. You don't need to get into the nitty gritty of everything. You can share the top line, you know, just the headline of your story. You have to take care of yourself first. And advocacy should not come at the cost of your own safety and your own mental health. And if anyone ever says that it should, that you should sacrifice that, that's not a good mission. So always make sure to take care of yourself. You're usually not alone, especially if you're here at advocacy legislation seminar. You got your battle buddies. You can count on us. You can count on the people in that room with you. And if it gets to be too much, you can say, you know what? I need to take a minute. And that staff will respect that. So just make sure that you're always taking care of yourself. And you can be vulnerable, but you don't need to cut yourself open every single meeting. Thanks, Julie and Scott. We did have a request uh, for one of our folks to be able to ask a question live. So um, Todd, I'm gonna allow you to do that right now if you're still with us. I am, thank you, Heather. So uh, uh, the guest speaker, John, uh, and thank you. This is Todd Camry, National Director for Paralyzed Veterans of America, Minnesota chapter. Uh, John, story uh, experiences with uh, the spouse kind of jumped out at me uh, about 10 12 years ago there was a big push and I've been around this advocacy for a long time um, but but back then there was trying to find a the, the catch word was seamless transition and and it reminded me that are are the services is the VA allowed to come in while the uh, soul they're going into rehab at Reed or any of the other non-VA re re uh, recovery or um, areas while they're still active duty, it seems like they should be being told of one, the advocacy of uh, the, the service organizations that are out there, which are very keen, especially PVA, on letting spouses and the and the veteran know that uh, these kind of things can be helped and addressed. 
is there still is is there still a need for a seamless transition? Um, I mean, if the VA is is falling down on the job, which is highly unlikely with heavy sarcasm, uh, is there a way that the DOD can draw upon the service organizations and especially PVA uh, to help with further information on how they can overcome that so that person doesn't have to worry about, do I have to go to my representative? I mean, once you go to the representative, yes, the ball gets rolling, but you know, if there's no transition help between the VA and the active duty veteran and rehab, uh, they've fallen back on the job. I hope that made sense. It did, Todd. And um, I'll just let Julie just briefly mention some of the work we're doing around transition, and then we'd be happy to follow up with you later. Thanks for that comment, Todd. Um, transition is a hot topic right now. Uh, there's recently been an oversight hearing. There's a lot of bills floating around out there. Um, everyone is still looking for that seamless transition. And the reality of it is no transition is, no two are the same. Everyone comes from a different perspective. Everyone comes from a different experience. Um, some veteran service organizations are able to engage at that level that you're discussing. Um, the issue becomes whether or not DOD will allow a VSO to be on base and that's from post to post. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of attitudes around it. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a very simple answer, but I assure you there's a lot of work being done at this level to try and finally capture that seamless transition. Um, I mean, this is sort of one of those evergreen issues. There's always going to be room for improvement, uh, but I am happy. You know, I'll send you an email and we can connect off offline off of this um, to discuss that a little bit more robustly. There are more services now than there historically have been at that moment in time, um, particularly from VA, particularly the VR&E um, program, they have uh, special integrated counselors that now work with uh, those transitioning service members post-injury. Um, but again, I will, we can dig into that uh, outside of this webinar. <laughs> so I have one uh, last question I, I wanna ask before we wrap up today, and that is, um, you know, what do you do when you're in a meeting with someone and maybe you don't agree with their politics? Um, well, how do you uh, prepare yourself for that meeting? And is there anything uh, differently that you would do versus maybe going in to see somebody who you just line up all the boxes with in terms of how you how you view the world versus somebody that maybe you don't really view the world the same way? Go ahead. Judy. I would like to I would like to chime in. Um, I am actually going to steal a quote from one of Scott's representatives. Uh, it's something that he likes to open every hearing with. Chairman Van Orden from Wisconsin uh, likes to say, this is not Republicans and Democrats. This isn't even a bipartisan uh, subcommittee. This is a nonpartisan subcommittee. So as John Powers mentioned, uh, politics has, no, has very little bearing on the conversations that exist around veterans. There's, every, there's always gonna be sparkly objects in the periphery that get caught up in smoke and mirrors and silly debate. That said, we're very fortunate in the veteran space where everybody pretty much agrees. The politics have no place in this because you know, when we're serving, there is no Republican and Democrat. You know, A foxhole is a foxhole and you've got your battle buddies back or you don't. And you're not gonna, you know, stand up for someone just because of their political party. When it comes to what you think you know, when it comes to the media, all that, when you go into an office and you advocate for a bill, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is they might support the bill. Um, you'd be amazed at how little politicking goes on in this game when it comes down to it. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you don't like what you hear in the national media because it may not be true, and you don't want that type of preconceived notion to judge the way you engage with that office because your biases might lose a co-sponsor or might, you know, change the way you talk to these people. And I'm sure Scott probably has something to say too. I, I, I do. I get a little more pointed. Um, I, 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 
I'm candid, but tactful. You know, Congress doesn't think twice about sending our men and women in uniform into harm's way, and they send them away as, as whole persons. So they owe it to those individuals to make them as whole as they possibly can upon their return. And that is a veteran issue, not a political issue. Um, I've also used, I know Heather may not have been a fan of some of my choice words about saying that a long-term health care facility for 12 beds only costs the same as one Patriot missile. But, you know, sometimes you have to put things in real, real terms for them. <laughs> as a former Patriot crew missile member, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a, a good note to end on. So Julie, I'm sorry, Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you for our final slides today. Thanks, Heather. All right, so that concludes our fourth webinar. I wanted to thank uh, both John and Scott, our participants, for joining us and giving us advice about their experiences, as well as Heather and Julie for the Q&A. Um, for participants that are viewing the recording later on, um, so that's not needed for our viewers that are doing viewing this live, if you'd like credit for the session, please email the code 4A2AAW to myself at lisae at pva.org. Join us for the last webinar in this series on August 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern time, where we will connect all of the dots. Thanks, everyone, and have a good day.